Hi, welcome to this edition of On Tap, presented by FC Side the Americas. I'm Wade Kaler, Executive Director. On Tap this week, I'm bringing someone out from the shadows of On Tap, who happens to also be a member of FCSI. He's responsible for a lot of the amazing intros, promos, and general behind the scene hijinks. He's got a pretty interesting and unique background leading up to an active career in the food service business. Please welcome the marketing manager of The Fuse, Mr. Matthew Martinez. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Hello, you mentioned the shadows. I'm afraid I might have brought a few more of those to this shot than probably is necessary, but uh, maybe I can do the uh, the whole like change my voice witness protection thing. Yeah, then there we I'll, go. You know, I'll just be yeah. Safe. yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that for you. The whole intro <laughs> for this whole entire interview how to alienate an audience 101. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, hey, man, thanks for joining us. I know it's always uncomfortable to be brought out from behind the scenes and put in front of the camera, as we saw in season one with Eric. So um, I know that you're going to do much better than he did. So I think that starting <laughs> off, we're going to be in much better position as it is. But before we get started, I mean, in all seriousness, talk about your background. I mean, how did you get your start that led you to working with the Fuse, who in turn then leads you to working with a tremendous amount of food service industry, uh, allied members, consultants, and everyone else in between. Sure. It might be a little bit of an ironic phrasing to say in all seriousness, because really my background in school was comedy. Um, um, I went to undergrad. I have my undergrad in theater performance. Thank God I took an under, like a minor in, uh, in English, uh, because that, it, it turns out it helped. But I graduated college with a theater degree in 2008 which means I joined the food service industry in 2008. Uh, <laughs> not a whole lot of jobs uh, for a theater major coming out around then during the crash. So I spent about seven years doing multiple jobs um, at a time, mostly including food service, so uh, grocery, deli, um, no, no restaurant, surprisingly enough, but I did do a, a spy shop. Um, eventually, well, during that time, I was also teaching improvisational comedy, which, as you can see, uh, pays super well. And um, <laughs> so in order to cover the cost, I had my own uh, I had my own training center for a while called Failure Factory. It produced too much failure in the end. <laughs> um, and so I eventually made my way to working at a brewery uh, in Cornelius, North Carolina, which is where I met the Fuse. They came in to help us rebrand one of the uh, lines that we were doing, well, rebrand the sours and then do a new line, which Eric and I collaborated on, which um, went on to win a Great American Beer Festival gold medal. And based on that workable, successful collaboration, uh, when inevitably as breweries do run out, <laughs> run out of money. But that's how I got connected there. And so Eric kind of pawned me. Uh, nice. Or, yeah, what's the word? Pawn is probably the devaluing myself a little bit uh no, I, he, snagged purchased he sna yeah he, he seduced uh, seduced seduced is a good word i like that yes uh certainly uh he seduced you into working in the fuse um yes so with your role at the fuse tell us a little bit about what you do within the the marketing firm sure so my specialty again kind of like i said is, is more along the messaging and copywriting and strategy side uh in the same way that i would teach students how to successfully navigate the strategies of interpersonal relationships in such a way that doesn't threaten anyone and in fact delight them to the point of laughter it tends to help businesses especially on the b2b and i've seen um strengthen relationships help get the messaging a little more solid and a little more retrievable um understandable human, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm pulled in on a lot for um, whether it's message creation and strategy, whether it's specific word phrasing, I'm generally pretty good at that. Um, turns out that if you can write a joke, you can write a tagline or a jingle. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at now, uh, okay. working with a lot of uh, consultants across the board. And so it's really been uh, a lot of fun. So as you said before, you've practiced as a stand-up comedian sometimes in your private life. I'll correct you there. It's improvisation. I don't do stand-up. It's too competitive, and I feel like it's mean-spirited a lot of the time. Improvisation okay. is more team-centric. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to know. I've never done that, or whether it's improv or stand-up or whatever it is. Tell me what it's like walking up on that stage knowing you could bomb at any moment or any show could just be a failure. Oh, it's terrifying, and it drills out part of your soul. 
<laughs> after a while. Um, but no, you get used to it. I mean, failures, you can't grow without failure. That's just yeah. the way you can't, you can't build a muscle back without breaking it down. Yeah. So in the same way, with messaging, interpersonal relationships, whatever, uh, it, takes, it takes that failure, which is why I had initially picked that. Well, speaking of failure, um, how many times did it take you to finally get to Chicago? It's only happened once, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was for NRA, what, three years ago, 2019? Yeah. And, uh, and that was it. I did get to see Improvised Shakespeare, which if you're in the Chicago area and they're still doing it, I don't know what's, what COVID has done to improv. I, I imagine killed it outright. Yeah. But Improv Shakespeare is good. Well, in Second City, of course. The other thing I, I uh, the spending time with you over the last year and a half of doing on tap, I do know that there's another passion you've got, which is also disc golf. And so, <laughs> that's right. When you get out, I know you're a big fan of it, but you also play a lot too for a big hobby. I don't know a lot about it, so tell me how good is your game of disc golf? I mean, comparable to the rest of the world. Wow. The, well, the rest of the world uh, of I assume you mean the disc golf playing world because to the world yeah. at large, I imagine I'm quite a lot better, but uh, I am, they do have it striation out at beginner, intermediate and advanced. And okay. I just barely am in between beginner and intermediate. So I can throw about 350 okay. feet. Uh, okay. So if that is any indication. Well, it, I hope that's good. I said, I'm not familiar <laughs> with it. I, I play the other version of golf with the little white ball and stick. So I don't know anything about disc golf, but it's certainly something that's intriguing that I see growing a lot more right now. So it is. Uh, I hear it's the world's fastest growing sport, but I, I mean, obviously during COVID, there was not a whole lot to do except to go out to parks with your family and do something in your yeah. little bubble. And disc golf kind of filled that niche pretty well. Absolutely, absolutely. What, um, as a marketing consultant, what are maybe the top three mistakes you see food service consultants doing on a regular basis when they're trying to attract new businesses? We'll say number one, but number two could just be as important. But not having the, the brand look and feel like the impression of the brand match the quality of their output. Um, a lot of times the concentration on the quality of product doesn't make it all the way to. So they have generally uh, architects or, or other consultants that they work with on a pretty regular basis over the course of the last 350 years. Uh, that they know exists out there. And so whenever they are talking about getting new projects, a lot of times they don't even know where to start the conversation because their external brand just doesn't even come close to matching their personality, doesn't come close to matching their quality of output. And so getting a brand to the point where those two are in sync is one of the biggest challenges. And it, it's kind of an educational challenge sometimes too to try to explain how important that is. Yeah. But as B2B is starting to look more and more like B2C, um, it's becoming more and more important to have your brand exist as a 24-7 asset that exists digitally um, yeah. on the internet somewhere. So, yeah, hopefully that... So you said three. Do you really want me to go three? Sure. Well, you got one more in you. Oh, yeah. Well, that was one. Uh, I would say number two, um, I mean, websites, websites matter. Um, and a lot of times it's easy to get sucked into the idea that one of the quick and dirty websites is kind of the way to go if all you need is a pamphlet out there, but it really is at the sacrifice of ownership. And if you want ownership over your own brand, if you want control over it to refine it in the way that you refine your, what you do for the other rest of the time that you're getting paid, uh, it needs to, it needs to kind of match that. And I, and I would say number three holy cow, the, there are some people that do really good with case studies. And then there's some that don't have a single one available to see. How are we supposed to delight anybody? How are we supposed to bring in new product, yeah. new projects, uh, if you don't have a case study? Following up with that then, what are the top three things that you think consultants should be doing as far as trying to attract new business? I mean, what if you had to say, I'll, here's three things you could do tomorrow, what would those top three things be? Uh, make sure that your buyer persona is your actual buyer persona and not what you think it is. Okay. Um, the reason to build a buyer persona is because you live in the bottle. It's really hard to read the label from the inside. So you're not entirely sure what your buyer persona thinks of you. You have an assumption. You're probably wrong. Two, I would say make sure that you know the educational process that your potential client, the client that you want to come in, has to go through. 
uh, you can, again, make assumptions that they already come in with a certain amount of knowledge out of the gate. Chances are you're wrong or you're using different terms as them. But until you can actually build out the funnel of education to get someone from being able to understand what their problem is at a very high level to being uh, more convinced that you can solve it at a more granular level, if yeah. you can make sure all that exists independent of you having to pick up the phone and talk them through the entire thing. If it can exist yeah. online, that's definitely something you should at least have the very rough uh, outline up there. And I would say number three, make sure that your uh, forms and contacts, uh, contact <laughs> uh, avenues are not being hacked. It's been, it's been pretty rough, the security of uh, over the last few years, everyone, I guess all the hackers are sitting in during COVID and figuring out new ways to hack websites, <laughs> but it's getting pretty rough out there. Uh, so uh, making sure your security is up to date is a simple thing that you can do that has pretty good ROI. That's a, that's a very good one. I like that. When, when it comes to BB or, or B2C marketing right now, um, you know, we see a lot of self-deprecating humor, especially from um, today's commercials and, and social media uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, marketing pieces that are being put out that are paid commercial pieces that are out there on social. Is is that something you're a fan of? Or is it something you're not a fan of? Where do you see that going? Uh, it's easy to say that any press is good press. I suppose at a certain level, uh, at a very like market-centric uh, wealth of nations level, fine. Yeah, getting your name out there. But it comes like you have to live with the consequences of your humor. If you're going to be a self-deprecating brand, then you better find new avenues to make sure that your your customers know the quality of it rather than yeah. just the ways that you can laugh it down. So it, it's, it has to do with the personality. If you have to have an exterior, and I know this is probably not something I should say as a third-party uh, consultant, but if you can't hold the humor of the brand without reaching out to another company, then you shouldn't. You, you shouldn't yeah. go down that path. Uh, but that being said, Wendy's is doing really good uh, with yeah. their their Twitter and stuff. They're shooting everybody down. Smarmy, sarcastic stuff was up, and I think it's kind of on its way out. It's kind of, I think it's played its course. No one can quite do as good as the best have. And so yeah. to, to try and do it poorly actually is worse than not trying. Yeah. I think a, a good group that does well is, uh, and I, I hate to bring up his name because we'll bring it up later too, but the Ryan Reynolds group does a pretty good job with mm -hmm. their, their ad agency um, doing a good job of, of being self deprecating without being self. -doubting. Okay. Well, I'll add a caveat then if you can get Ryan Reynolds to do your marketing, <laughs> well, of course, then that's a different absolutely ballgame. go for it. Yeah. But he's, but I was going to say that the reason I bring him up is he's one of the few that gets how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not just self deprecating. You know, no. they figured out how to do it with fun versus just making fun of ourselves. It's, you know, it's making fun of other things in a respectful way versus just making fun of ourselves. Right. It's also a hand fake. It's kind of magician hand fake. Like, yeah. I'm not selling something. It's funny. Uh, yeah. But you are selling something. You might as well be honest about it uh, at yeah. the end of the day. But if you can, if you can ease the blow of salesmanship yeah. with a little bit of humor, then yeah. awesome. I've heard a rumor you haven't cut your hair since COVID shutdowns began. That is um, correct. How long has it gotten from the beginning till it is now? I mean, where were we to begin with and where are we now today? Well, I'm not going to say I ever got quite as short as yours. Um, <laughs> well, not even since birth. I have pictures to prove that. Um, <laughs> it, was a regular, it was a regular business cut. It was one that uh, I would not have gotten scolded at church for having. Okay. So and, and uh, now, now I'm just my mother's horrified, uh, my my <laughs> company uh, embarrassed, and and I should really fix that scenario. But you know, what's the end goal, it, or is there one? I want to say that I've donated to Locks of Love. Oh, nice! I think that would be a cool thing to have done. And I so agree. I'm, yeah, so I'm trying to get it to that point. How long do you have to go for that? Is it? I believe it's between eight. It's over eight inches. Can't be. Certain. Okay. They have they have different qualifications. I believe you have to just get a cut and then mail it in, which I don't know how to mail hair, um, but we'll figure it out. Should be I, fun. I bet there's a salon in Charlotte that can figure that out for you. Uh, That'll be well, good. If they I are like marketing that. is good enough for me to Google it, I will go there. There you go. I love that. What's one other thing maybe about Matt Martinez that no one would ever guess? 
oh man, I could probably list a lot of things that people would be like, I knew it. Uh, I do a lot of tabletop role playing games. I like to be a DM uh, a lot of times. I've been a part of, uh, especially over COVID, a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Uh, so that probably surprises no one. Uh, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, do, I'll say this, and it probably ruins uh, another question down the line. But I really, uh, my, my secret love is Nora Ephron films. I love uh, anything okay. with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan having their little love hijinks with a quirky sidekick like Dave Chappelle. So That's a, I love that. I don't know if that fills the gap. I think are. so. What's, what's one piece of advice you give anyone thinking of getting into marketing on the food service side of the industry? You probably got into it because you liked food. I would say that there's more to it than that. Uh, it's, yeah. if, if you can't get it down, you're, you're still in the service industry. Mm -hmm. So being a servant to the best of your ability is, is going to work in your best interest forever. So while, yeah, shoots might be sexy, you might be able to be in the shadows with a cool background for a little bit. At the end of the day, if you're not providing value to uh, your, your clients, you should probably think of another way of uh, earning a living. So, so just keeping, keeping the benefit that you can provide um, and know that there's a, there's a ton of community out there that has your back. So it's yeah. a, you know, rely on that. You're not alone. Nice. Um, as long as I've known you, you seem to have the largest wealth of most obscure knowledge <laughs> that I know uh, when it comes to facts about almost anything. I am extremely trivial. Yes. Off, off the top of your head, tell me the most, like the top five obscure facts that pop into your head right now. We started doing it again. Everybody's gotten back into it at FCSI and everything else. Top most obscure facts about travel. See, the problem with obscure facts is that I think everyone knows them. And then I say it and people are like, where in the world did you hear that? So it's probably <laughs> wrong. Uh, I'm looking at the NASCAR Hall of Fame. That's pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Um, I, I don't know. I heard a fact that there's, uh, you can get just by sitting in a NASCAR uh, race that you can get heavy ear damage permanently for sitting too close to to the race itself. Is that that's maybe pretty, that counts? That's a pretty obscure fact. Most obscure fact about the city of Charlotte. Um, that, uh, Queen Charlotte was the Queen's consort and she was a person of color, which not a lot of people know, and that she made a lot of positive changes during her reign as the Queen's consort. Second of all, uh, probably apocryphal, but, uh, they say that there were the Charlotte Hornets because, uh, our early settlers, whenever, um, we had soldiers come in during the Revolutionary War, they would, uh, get hornets' nests and bounce them onto the, the ground like a basketball before throwing it into, uh, the ranks of the British to kind of mess them up a little bit. That seems, that seems like a, uh, written after the fact, fact. Yeah. Um, yeah. George Washington nice. called the city a trifling place, which I find awesome. That is very good. I like those. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, I know that you personally within the FUSE have been working with a lot of focus groups, uh, mm. especially the college and university food service directors, doing a lot of research for different companies. What are some of the things that maybe you've learned that surprised you during this research about the college and university market? Uh I would say in the, in the, I mean, I'm probably surprised in a horrific way for, with a couple of, of those, but I think surprised in a delighted way that a lot of the kind of um, what you might think of tertiary um, programs in school jumped in to help. Like, for instance, uh, fabric programs jumping in to make masks or chemistry programs jumping in to make hand sanitizer from scratch to kind of help fill the gaps uh, in not just because obviously to begin with, there was a pretty big demand for a lot of those yeah cleaning items and so they just made them nice. like oh that's cool where do you see them going in the near future or, or ha, are bankrupt no i'm just kidding no well, let me rephrase that a little bit anyway I, I, so i'm glad you didn't answer correctly no where do you see or what do you see changes that have happened because of covid in the university dining market currently like what have they had to do now to adapt to today's student or have they is it stayed somewhat relatively the same now that we're sort of back to school I mean, I, I hate to put it in, in this way, but it, surprising no one, it really comes down to a red-blue okay. uh, geographic area tends yeah. to. I know a lot of, uh, not a whole lot has happened. There's a lot of the all-you-care-to-eat or uh, like salad bar type programs in Texas. They <laughs> didn't have to touch it. Yeah. Whereas uh, I know a lot of, you know, in the Northeast, they ripped it up 
and quick and, and turned it into grab and go as quickly as they could. So it, it uh, in a lot of ways had to do with politics and bet. geography. All right. Well, that's all the formal questions I've got for you. But as you know, more than anyone, I come <laughs> up with a bunch of questions for us to go through. And so I've got a bunch of would you rather questions that you're going to have to sit through. Um, and this time you get cool. to be put on the hot seat for them. Let's do it. Would you rather have the ability to move things with your mind or the ability to read minds? I'll be honest. I'm not sure I've ever moved anything without using my mind. But uh, I, I would say move my mind. I think thoughts should remain private in the same way that I think uh, people should have privacy online in, you know, in their homes. Nice. Would you rather be forced to sing or dance for every song that you hear? Given that I listen to the bulk of my music in the car, I feel like dancing would be a, a hazard. Um, <laughs> but if I could do it upper body only, I would definitely do the dance. Uh, I okay. feel like that would just be a nice way to burn some extra calories during the day. <laughs> Perfect. Would you, would you rather be chronically underdressed or overdressed? Chronically? Yes. I'd rather be dressed acutely. Um, <laughs> I would say if, I, if it was supernatural in that way, overdressed, man. That'd be awesome. But as it is, if I was going to be perfectly honest, it would be underdressed. Very good. Would you rather have universal respect or unlimited power? Uh, let's, let's go power. I think that's the easy answer. Uh, respect. Is it the expense of the other? Like you no, have to have respect without power? Oh, well then power. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll power my way to respect. There you go. Would you rather never be able to go out during the day or never be able to go out during the night? I play disc golf, so I would like to be out during the day. And I know, I mean, you may not think of it by looking at me, but I'm not much of a night party animal, so I stay in anyway. Are you, would you rather lounge by the pool or lounge on the beach? Uh, beach. Would you rather wear the same socks for a month or the same underwear for a week? Uh, it's cute of you to think I have underwear on. Um, <laughs> I would probably a week I could handle. Well, see, you'd, you'd be able to sit both of them up and against the wall at the end of either one of those. Well, but I'd, uh, socks. Would you rather spend a week in the forest or a night in a real haunted house? Uh, so the forest is now as scary as a supernaturally haunted house. No, the forest, man. I actually really like, maybe that's something that you wouldn't necessarily, no, I have long hair and a beard. I like bushcrafting stuff. So uh, going out into the woods and making a shelter sounds freaking sweet. Okay. Would you rather get a paper cut every time you turn a page or bite your tongue every time you eat? <laughs> uh, this, this question brought to you by Kindle. Um, I, I, would, I would be able to survive just on ebooks and audiobooks. So and I, <laughs> biting my tongue makes me irrationally angry. I will end up really probably punching the nearest person in the face where I had to bite my tongue all the time. So I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to bring up this gentleman's name again. Uh, would you rather sip aviation gin with Ryan Reynolds or shoot tequila with Dwayne, the rock Johnson? I really feel like we should look deeper into this. I mean, you have Deadpool on your <laughs> table. It's Ryan Reynolds questions. I mean, obviously Ryan Reynolds is the question. I feel like the rock has about as much personality as his namesake. So um, I'll go with the former. Okay, perfect. Would you rather have skin that changes color based on your emotions or tattoos that appear based on what you did yesterday? Uh, the Ray Bradbury illustrated man question. Um, so I'll go with the, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The mood ring skin tones. Okay. Would you rather be beautiful and stupid or unattractive and a genius? To me, it's the most easy question that I have heard this round, but I would, it's most definitely beautiful and stupid. Would you rather be crazy and not know it or crazy and know it? Well, I'd rather not know it. Let's go uh, beautiful <laughs> and stupid. Thank you. Would you rather only be able to eat pizza for a year or not be able to eat pizza for five years? I would pick the not eat pizza for five years. I feel like I could simulate the flavors in other ways. To really? get my pizza fix. Yeah. I mean, are you saying like all flat bread related items are off the table? Do if it if it's a flat bread with no tomato sauce, is that a pizza? We're going to start splitting hairs pretty quick. So Yeah, well, uh, a, a pizza with alfredo sauce is a pizza. A pizza with I would call it a flat bread with alfredo. A, sauce. a breakfast pizza with cheese sauce is a breakfast pizza. So uh, breakfast pizza with cheese sauce is a heart attack. No, it's amazing. You've never is been to really? Yeah, you've never been to Casey's Pizza in the Midwest. They make a no. breakfast pizza that is 
Unbelievable. Last question for the Would You Rathers. Would you rather go backstage with your favorite band or be an extra on your favorite TV show? Um, I know Extra Life stinks, so I would definitely do the band thing. Well, that's all the questions I've got for you, Matt. But before we get going, tell everybody how they can find out more about you and The Fuse. Sure. Um, we primarily live online. Thefuse.net is uh, where you can find our basics. If you want a little bit more, uh, drill down on us individually. LinkedIn, of course. I don't necessarily uh, say all social media. Just let's go with LinkedIn. Hopefully the rest disappears soon enough. <laughs> All right, that wraps up the edition of On Tap presented by FCSI. A huge thank you to Matt for joining us today. You of all people, when it comes to all the people I interview, we couldn't do this show without members like you. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your favorite podcast and turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any future episodes. But until then, cheers. Cheers.